尊敬的各位来宾，欢迎参加国际创新分论坛——英国老牌教育强国的教育科技转型。下面有请演讲嘉宾上场。Distinguished guests, welcome to participate in the International Innovation Sub Forum, UK, EdTech Evolution and Opportunities. Next, let's invite our speakers on stage. Well, good afternoon. Thank you very much for coming. Um, we're here for this session to talk about the UK EdTech system and some of the changes that we've seen over recent years and the opportunities that brings us, both in the UK and in an international context, for UK companies and international investors. Uh, we've got a lot to cover, but um, there's been a lot going on in the UK recently. We've seen an increased focus in Britain on the integration of technologies into schools and colleges to address a range of issues, including teacher workload, teacher supply, and a significant shift in the UK's curriculum focus to really inject rigour and focus on future employability and skills. As a result, we've now got data that shows that technology is used in more than half of all lessons taught in Britain. And to help explore these issues and look at some of the future trends, we've got a panel of experts here who specialise in the UK market. So I'm going to invite each of them individually to come up here and share their thoughts and um, knowledge and details of what they're doing in the UK context. And then we're going to widen it out for a, a discussion and debate. So get your questions ready. I've got some, but we'll be opening up to questions from the floor. So first of all, I'm going to invite Andrew Thraves, who is a trustee at uh, Britain's largest multi-academy trust, AET, and managing director of Optimus Education. Thank you, Andrew. I need to have three hands, I just realised. I've got that, I've got this, I've got this. So we'll have to see how this have to see how this goes. So uh, as Caroline's mentioned, I'm Andrew Twig. I'm here to tell you about uh, how open the schools in England, the Academy's Enterprise Trust. Uh, has used cloud technology to improve teaching and learning. I think the dealer slides are all working behind me. I'm managing director of a company called Optimus Education. Optimus provides digital curriculum, resources, teacher training, and career advice and guidance. We're in about 7,000 schools in the UK, which is probably uh, We also have a network of 240 advisors. So we do digital and we do face to face. So the Academy's Enterprise Trust is a MAT, an M-A-T. What is a MAT? It's up there, but I'll go through it really quite briefly, picking out the main, uh, the main points. A MAT is a single entity established to collaborate strategically with a group of schools with the sole intention of supporting the improvement of teaching and learning. So the MAT is accountable for the governance of each school in the group. There is a direct line of communication between the MAT and the separate schools, so there is no reporting to a local educational authority. The schools in the MAT, though, they are still state schools, they're not private schools, they're not independent schools, they are still state schools. Let's say you logo. Find your remarkable is our message to pupils and teachers. Just let me tell you a bit about the UK education system to set the context. Currently 32,000 schools in the UK, 24,000 of these are in England. There are 738 maths in England that manage at least two schools. 13 of those 738 have 26 or more schools in their MAT. AET is the largest of those maths in England. We have 64 schools. As you can see on the map, the schools are all over England. And that's one of the issues that we're trying to deal with. So these are the problems that we've been having in the last few years, and then I'll talk about the solution. So as you've seen on the previous slide, our schools are all over England. Therefore, it's quite difficult to have them communicating with each other. If you look at our virtual learning environment and also our content, it's quite old. All the schools have bought into different systems over the last few years, all of them have bought into different content over the 
last few years. They've all made separate buying decisions in each of their schools. The other significant factor is travel time. So, um, in terms of travel, uh, because the schools are all uh, quite disparate across, uh, across England, it's very difficult to share best practice. Ooh. It's very difficult to share best practice amongst those schools. So our solution is a cloud-first technology solution. We've decided to go to the cloud. One of the reasons for that is that our uh, research, our market research, and our research from teachers suggested that uh, at least 26% of teachers wanted to move to that. And the system we are using is a Google solution. It is our digital glue. We're rolling things out in three phases. So we're rolling the phases out in terms of um, 2012 we started, and we are finishing in, uh, we finished at the end of last year, 2017. So overall, it took five years. And I'm going to conclude just by showing you some of the bits and pieces that we've done. So one of the things is we've created a governor portal. This means that governors will log on and they'll go onto an intranet, onto the web, where we put up all the notes, all the guidance and everything else. So it also means they can look at the governance of other schools in the system as well. We've created a policy portal where we put up all our templates, all our HR guidance and so on and so forth, that all teachers can access from the centre. Students will use the system to cast their work, so it does mean that they can actually share their work not only with peers in the school and the teachers, but also with uh, peers in other education institutions in the MAT. We believe in personalised learning and 24-7 learning, so through the various pieces of hardware that we have, it means that students can work anytime, any place, anywhere. Teachers likewise, and also, as well as sharing all the resources within the MAT, teachers are beginning to share the resources with other schools as well. And I'm going to conclude, because I'm running slightly over time, Ofsted is our school's inspectorate, and these are some of the things that Ofsted has said about our new system. They say that it has a positive effect on student teaching and learning. It says for teachers, it allows the teachers to comment more readily, more quickly, and for wherever the teacher is at that point in time, on the student's work. And my final slide, I think, is an important one, because we at AET believe that whether you're a teacher or whether you're a pupil, you're essential to the future of UK PLC. And we believe that technology is the best way that we can get there sooner rather than later. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. So we've heard from the, the infrastructure, the top level of how schools are set out in the United Kingdom. Delighted now to invite Rob Grimshaw, who's CEO of TES Global, which is the world's largest community of teachers and so much more. Um, and Rob will describe what you're up to. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, thank you, Caroline. Um, my name is uh, Rob Grimshaw. I'm the chief executive of TES. Um, you can find us um, online at tes.com. That's T-E-S um, dot com. Um, and we have uh, a digital platform um, that provides... Uh, uh, an environment for millions of teachers um, all over the world uh, to share expertise and insights and we also help thousands and thousands of schools uh, run their institutions effectively uh, primarily by finding them the teachers that they need um, for their classrooms. Um, now we're a mission driven organisation uh, we believe in the power of great teaching um, we are here to support and connect teachers and schools um, and to help them do the thing that they love uh, which is to improve the lives of children um, through education um, and it's a mission that matters because education is um, a tough challenge um, it is a challenge globally because the demand for education is increasing rapidly um, as the population of young people around the world expands UNESCO estimates that the world would need um, net another 20 million teachers over the next decade um, that have to be trained and pushed into systems um, around the globe, not, not least um, here uh, in China. Um, it's also hard locally um, because of challenges um, around workload and the pressure of being a, t a teacher in any classroom in the world. Um, in the past year, 40,000 teachers in the UK quit the profession. Um, because of, mainly because of workload issues. And those problems exist 
um, in other countries around the world as well. So just when we need more teachers, um, they're departing from the profession. So how can we help? How can TES help? Um, well, we can help because we've got scale. Um, we have 11.6 million teachers who are registered to use our platform, um, coming from virtually every country on the globe. Um, and we can also help because we've got expertise, um, primarily in digital, um, and we can bring that expertise to bear to help solve problems on behalf of schools and teachers. And what kind of problems can we help solve? Well, um, take lesson planning. Um, teachers are delivering four or five lessons a day, five days a week, 40 weeks a year. Um, in classrooms all over the globe. In the UK, teachers will plan and deliver half a billion lessons a year. It's a huge overhead on the profession. Um, so making that task easier fundamentally helps teachers in their professional lives. Um, TES runs a lesson planning exchange on its platform um, where individual teachers can upload lesson plans and share them with the rest of the profession, allowing teachers around the world um, to avoid reinventing the wheel and to draw on the professional expertise um, of their colleagues um, around the planet. Um, in the past 12 months, we've had over 200 million downloads from that platform. So think about the number of lessons um, that they have been used in. Think about um, the number of children who have had their lives touched by those materials shared amongst the profession um, on tes.com. Uh, we also provide tools that help teachers manage behaviour in the classroom so that they can get rid of low-level disruption that gets in the way of education. What other problems can we solve? Well, um, the world is clearly going to have a shortage of teachers. Um, many countries have a shortage of teachers right now. Um, so we are helping by training teachers, delivering new teachers into the system. We're one of the biggest teacher training organisations in the UK. And we have a unique approach to it using um, blended learning uh, where the academic material um, for the curriculum um, is available online and that's complemented with classroom practice um, to provide a uniquely effective teacher training approach. It's an approach that we've just exported into, into Dubai. Um, we've now developed an international PGCE um, and we can run this um, anywhere in the world um, in cooperation with schools. Um, what other problems can we solve? Well, I mentioned earlier that uh, we help schools find the teachers that we need. We're specialists in this. We've done it for many, many decades. Um, and we've worked with 25,000 schools in the past five years um, from 109 countries around the globe, finding them the teachers that they need for their institutions. Um, and we have a well-developed digital platform to support this, backed up by an enormous database that contains the details of tens of thousands of teachers. Um, and uh, we can help um, in all sorts of ways um, to help schools that need teachers find what they need for their classrooms. Um, so, what do schools come to TES for? Um, they come to us so that we can help them attract, train and empower um, their teaching staff um, through digital technologies um, and make their institutions more successful and more effective as a result. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. And great to hear of a responsible organisation addressing all those challenges that we face, not just in the UK, but around the world. Um, moving on, our next guest is Christine Major, who's Partnerships a Director at Discovery. This is, um, as we hear from Christine, an amazing product that's used in the majority of British schools. Christine. Ni hao. Ni hao. Lovely to be here. Uh, my name is Christine. Uh, I'm here from Discovery Education. May I ask, is anybody familiar with Discovery Education? A few hands. Discovery Education was founded um, as the educational division of Discovery Television. Is anybody familiar with Discovery Television? Yeah. Lots more hands going up. Well, let's find out what Discovery Education does in the UK and in the international space.
very difficult to come on after that music. Um, so you heard a little bit, you saw a little, got a taste uh, of what we do at Discovery Education, uh, both in the UK and internationally. Uh, when we think about Discovery Education in the UK, how is it that we're supporting our educators? Uh, for the past nearly 20 years, we've been supporting schools, serving digital content through our services, espresso education and coding, uh, and STEM being a big focus for us going forward. It's not necessarily about the digital content, and through the course of this afternoon, we'll be exploring what helps the successful embedding of technology into schools. We'll be talking about professional development and really supporting educators as they bring technology into the curriculum. When we think about discovery education, we think about those large numbers there in terms of the teachers and the students that we're, we're supporting. Um, one thing is, is evident really across the organisation, and that really is where we started off. 30 years ago, Discovery was founded by John Hendricks. The first broadcast that went out, and the first phone call that came in, was from a teacher saying, I would love to use that content in the classroom. Um, and so was born really the foundation stone of the organisation and that really is that media can do much more than entertain. You see that through all of our services, the content, the professional development, and what we're doing to really help inspire uh, teachers and students. Media can educate, it can really inspire, but critically it can help students engage with the world around them. We'll be exploring these themes throughout the panel uh, and through the questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. And our final panellist is Dr. Becky Sage, who is the uh, CEO of a really dynamic, engaging, young British company that's, that's really solving a problem we have with uh, science education. Over to you, Dr. Sage. Thank you. Um, yeah, as Caroline said, I'm, I'm Becky Sage. I'm CEO of Interactive Scientific. I'm very much representing the startups within the UK uh, EdTech community. Um, of everyone who's here on the panel today. Uh, so we've created an immersive digital platform that brings to life the invisible scientific world. Um, that platform's called NanoSimbox. And it's actually been built so that anyone, from a science learner to a cutting edge scientific researcher, can push the limits of the molecular world without being afraid of the consequences. So I'm gonna show you a quick video um, so you get a better idea of what we do and who we do it for. about what we do is that we've always built our learning platform using rigorous science. Um, and it, really everything we do are built on these three pillars of discovery, on understanding, experimentation, and collaboration. So whether you're learning and making new discoveries for yourself, or you're a science researcher who's trying to push science discovery for all of the human race, then our platform has been built in a way that can work for you. Um, unlike everybody else here, we're, we're not, we haven't got lots of big numbers. We've got a beta platform, uh, one that's being used in the education space. So we've had about 40 schools, mostly in the UK, using that, and a couple of schools internationally, including one here in Shanghai, um, in China, in Shanghai. And, um, and really, it, for our science platform for learning is all about making the invisible scientific world visible. So much of science is invisible, and that means that it can be really hard to grasp. Um, not only are you learning new vocabulary, um, new concepts, but you have to do it around these entities that are invisible. Um, so with NanoSimbox, we make them visible. We make it so that anyone can see and interact with the scientific world. So one of our big goals is to open up doors to science to a much wider demographic of people. So we're about increasing the number of people who come from 
lower socioeconomic groups and giving them opportunities to get engaged and, and develop the skills they need to develop to get into the science workplace, as well as addressing the gender balance um, by delivering science learning in new ways. And then something that's been talked about a lot across this whole, con uh, this, this whole conference is workplace skills. Instead of delivering science learning that is just there because it's on the curriculum and it's something that we need to learn, we're actually delivering science learning through a tool that's also being used within the scientific, re um, scientific workplace. And I think that's a really important aspect of what we do. So you'll find out a little bit more about me through the panel, and so I will leave it there. But if you want to get in touch, then my email address is down here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Becky. Lovely. So um, I'd like to invite the panel up. We're going to take some questions. I think they're just going to move a little bit of furniture around. Um, and do come up with your own questions too. So I'll kick off with a few, but then we'll start some discussions. hearing um, all of the views from the panel there. Um, I'll just start off with a, a, a few thoughts. Um, really heard there, we're talking about the evolution of the UK um, sector, and we've had so much more of a focus on impact and research um, as we move forward, looking at increasing accountability levels and wanting to see the exact um, level of evidence that's shown for educational improvements in schools. Just really interested, particularly Becky and Christine, how's that impacted on the way you work with schools and what schools have been interested in from your products? Yeah, um, so first it's been about uh, collaborating with schools right from the beginning. Um, so the very first thing we did before we built any technology, before we did anything, was we talked to schools. <laughs> and we, we talked to teachers, we talked to learners. Um, and we, so we developed the, the technology off the, off the back of those need-finding exercises. Um, and I guess maybe because I have a science background myself, I, I never wanted to deliver something that wasn't really strongly evidence-based. I definitely had a need to be like, if we're going to do something that's making a difference, then how do we show that we're making a difference? And um, that is by continually working in the classroom. We, we carry out what's called user-centric design processes as we develop our tools. Um, but also, really importantly, we partner with other people who are experts in education. And um, we're actually part of a program uh, that's run in London called the Educate Program um, out of Univers University College London. And that program is all about bringing together ed tech uh, with the education community and the researchers who've been working in education and doing those three things together. So it's about kind of having this this helical uh, kind of spiral of activities so that, that you bring all those things together at once. How do you make sure that you are gathering the right evidence um, and feeding that evidence back into the work that you do and how you communicate your product? I, I love the comment you just made there about making a difference. Uh, because when you're talking to schools, when you're talking to districts, when you're talking to country leaders, it's always that question, you know, what difference will it make? Uh, and I think that question resonates across our entire organisation as well. You see it especially when we're thinking about product design. What difference will this make? Uh, when we're you know, creating new products for the market, it's with a view. How can we use data in the back end? How can we uh, you know, give educators access to that data? You know, it's quality um, data for their assessment and for their differentiation and for their, uh, their planning going forward. But it's not just about that, because one of the bigger questions, and it's wonderful that we've been um, addressing that in lots of the sessions so far, um, what impact can technology make? And that's a really interesting question to dig into. But when we are thinking about the opportunity for technology, when we're thinking about the impact of technology uh, on education, we've got to be very cognizant about how we're supporting educators in that process. Um, how are we supporting teachers being successful in bringing technology into the curriculum and into uh, the classroom? Wonderful to hear all the suggestions and the opportunities that AI uh, can bring to, to that process. Um, but taking it back, so when we're thinking about our educators, 
and using technology. How do we support that? Um, you know, technology is a tool ethos. Um, we're talking about uh, 21st century learning skills, for example. It's something that you know resonates in lots of the sessions that we've heard so far. So how are we supporting educators with instructional strategies uh, that really support and foster 21st century learning skills in the classroom? So for us as an organisation, it's what difference will it make? Uh, we see that resonate in the products, but especially um, with regards to supporting teachers. And that piece is critical. It must go hand in hand. Thank you very much. Um, I take a lot of British companies around the world to different events and it's been fascinating for me since we had large scale curriculum change in the UK in 2012-2013 we introduced a, a wide range of changing um, curriculum coding from the age of five, the first country to do that around the world. And I get a lot of interest internationally from different countries and governments wanting to find out more. How's it really impacted at the front line in terms of what your products and how schools are dealing with the curriculum change? Particularly interested, Andrew and Christy. Yeah, I'll go um, I think one of the interesting things that's happening is quite a focus on soft skills. We call it soft skills in the UK. So we've always been quite obsessed with a national curriculum that's here, it's here to stay, no doubt. Um, gradually, though, what we're finding is that more and more young people are coming out, not necessarily what employ with the skills that employers might want them to have, team working, um, networking, all that kind of thing as well. One of the things I think technology can make a big difference in uh, UK schools is actually allowing those soft skills to get embedded in the system, because it's one of those areas it's quite tricky to uh, implement in the national curriculum. But I think that employers, uh, employer relationships with teachers and pupils and schools, that can be done by technology. Um, careers shows uh, we have in the UK as well, where that's about identifying what might be the most appropriate career for the young person. And then it's, also, it's about their curriculum skills, but it's also about their soft skills. And then if the school's not delivering the soft skills, the pupil can go and search out those soft skills developments themselves using technology. So I think it's going to be quite a big thing moving forwards. Um, Generally in the world, I mean, a lot of countries are beginning to realise that young people might be coming out great at maths, great at English, whatever it might be, science, but they don't have the soft skills that are required uh, for economies of the future. Uh, yeah, just to echo, to echo that point, I think what was very interesting when the curriculum change came in um, in the UK in 2014, 2013 we had notice of it, yeah, 2014... Um, the curriculum did change, and to Caroline's point, it was the first time that we had coding coming into the curriculum, and then for children as young as five years old. And there was a big shift, it was a significant shift. For the first time, students were no longer learning how to um, use a program, they were learning how to think in a computational way, and that was quite a shift. They were thinking um, uh, how to take a problem, how to break it down into the component parts, how to use logic. Um, so that was quite a change. Uh, and to, to Andrew's point there, these are the kind of skills and thinking abilities that we need for career progression pathways um, of tomorrow. Um, it's interesting that we are now, through the curriculum, able to offer children the chance to you know, be more creative, to, to work maybe more collaboratively. Um, and those are two key um, areas of interest for sure. Thank, Thank you. you. Can, I just have, can I just have... There's an interesting bit about that as well, though, um, in the sense that... Um, UK curriculum will have, or the English curriculum will have a bit of a change next year with this thing we have called the Common Inspection Framework, which Ofsted I mentioned in, in my presentation. Those are the guys that go out and inspect schools in England, state schools in England. Um, the Common Inspection Framework, which is what they use to inspect the schools, that's changing next year. There's likely to be more of a focus on the soft skills piece. Now the really interesting thing in the UK at the minute, I'm not sure if it's the same in China or other areas, there's a real focus on mental health and well-being. And there's also the argument, and this might be a negative thing to say, but hey, I'm going to say it anyway. Um, mental health and well-being, a lot of it, uh, people seem to suggest, is down to technology. And young people paying too much te attention to technology, especially uh, social networking and so on and so forth. So I think there's an interesting dynamic going down in the UK at the moment, and will do so over the next few years as well, which is about re-evaluating the place of technology, especially in terms of um, its effect on young people's mental health and well-being. So watch this space, because it's going to be quite interesting. 
That's fascinating. And actually, the mention of the word Ofsted brings me on to, I want to ask Rob the next question, actually, because we, we hear a lot about teachers feeling under pressure. And in Rob's presentation, he talked about pressure on uh, the teacher supply and workloads. I mean, your organisation, you've got your finger on the pulse exactly of what teachers are feeling across the world. How can we support teachers and, and what's TES doing on that? We're doing a lot of stuff on this front. Um, and I talked uh, in my intro about the, the lesson planning platform, which I think is, has made a massive difference to uh, teachers all over the world. Um, I mean, teaching actually historically could be quite an isolated profession. You know, once the door of the classroom is closed, it's just you in the class. Um, yeah, digital technology is fixing that um, actually at a massive scale. Uh, we have uh, you know, individual teachers who have shared resources on the platform um, that have been downloaded in over 100 countries um, a million plus times. So, you know, what one teacher can have an impact, a massive impact on, on education around the world. Um, that definitely helps. Um, we uh, are also focused on trying to empower teachers in the classroom. Teachers from, from all countries will tell us that even in, in well-behaved schools with good kids, low-level disruption in the classroom um, is a real challenge because it just gets in the way. It, it's kind of... Um, uh, is not conducive to, to good education. You've got to get past that before you can get kids to learn. Um, we have a, a wonderful um, product called Class Charts, which helps um, teachers to manage behaviour through an interface um, that they use live in, in the classroom. Um, and the feedback that we get um, from teachers on that is tremendous. And anecdotally, schools tell us that using those kind of systems actually helps improve their um, their ratings, it reduces exclusions, um, and gets the right environment in school for, for teachers to um, uh, for teachers to be successful. Um, I think the, the other thing to, to mention is that um, before um, teachers and schools can get to the task of education, um, there's often an awful lot that gets in the way. There are many um, just basic processes in schools that just don't work particularly well. And they're often they're small institutions. They don't have big technology departments that can go out and, and fix problems. Um, and as an organisation, we've been dedicating ourselves to fixing some of those things. So if you take recruitment, um, I don't think any head teacher gets up in the morning and thinks, I really want to go out and recruit teachers today. Um, this is you know, a, a fun task that I want to engage in. Actually, it's really, really difficult. It's a multi-layered process that involves lots of different moving parts. So we've created just a set of workflow tools that manage all the parts of the hiring process. Um, you know, uh, 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 resources like online application forms, video interviewing tools, candidate scoring tools um, that, that just uh, support the process end to end and make it slick and straightforward and easy. Because why should it be difficult? Um, you know, they, they, they shouldn't be spending time on this. It should be straightforward. And especially in an environment where there is a shortage of teachers, um, you want to maximise. Um, the available resources in the organisation and focus them on the classroom. Um, I should you know, mention that there are other uh, UK firms, people like Firefly, um, Arbor, that are working on trying to create um, a better environment uh, in terms of uh, you know, the, uh, making running schools an easier task. Um, we were talking earlier on, before this session, I was just really struck by um, some statistics that, that I heard colleagues here talking about that, that want to move on to teacher training. We hear there's a growing demand for education in developing countries, and the UNESCO estimates the need for 69 million new teachers by 2030 against 80 million that we've got today to meet the growing demand. And, you know, training of those teachers has got to be a massive challenge in all that. And particularly, and anyone can be your views, but particularly um, Rob and Becky, obviously, Rob, what you're doing at TES. But Becky, you're developing something that when you hear about teacher shortages and training needs, STEM's got to be up there in terms of um, helping support new teachers in the classroom. Tell us about what you think our industry can do. Yeah, OK. Um, so certainly, certainly STEM is a big challenge and you see those stats in teaching, you see those stats in STEM as well, you know, massive shortfall in the number of people who are going to be skilled enough in those, in those areas. So um, as, as I showed up here, our platform is one that takes you from learning all the way up through and, and I definitely think that that plays a part in helping with this challenge that we've got around maybe a lack of teachers or a, a lack of the, the skill sets that we need. Um, 
And, and one of those things is very simple. If you've got something that's digital that you're delivering, um, it's on the cloud, um, then that's something that people, and you design it for student exploration and kind of self-development, then in fact you can go a little bit further in terms of developing skills, um, whether that be in the learners or in the teachers uh, at whatever stage, um, that can then be used and can help fill that gap. So I think that there's... Uh, that, that's a big part of it, which is that if, we, if we've got something digital, we can start to put these tools out there um, that we can develop skill sets. Um, for me, another thing is about making things engaging and fun. <laughs> um, and, you know, maybe some of this low-level disruption um, stops happening if we've got tools that are more engaging, that kind of then enable what was low-level disruption to in fact be curiosity and to be some drive and, and some kind of team working or working towards challenges together. Um, and that can then help with the churn rate because of course one of the big problems we have with teachers is that they drop out a lot and that's due to all of these pressures, one of which being these challenges in the classroom. So I think there's different ways that di digital um, technology is helping with that and that we're specifically trying to help with that. Um, yeah, I, I think there's an enormous challenge around um, teacher training. Uh, you know, the statistics that Ka Caroline mentioned, um, and I refer to my, my intro, um, uh, represent uh, uh, a huge um, problem for the world in, in the next 10 years. I mean, the, 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 the number of teachers that need to be trained to meet the needs um, in countries around the globe is simply enormous, and probably traditional approaches to teacher training um, are not actually going to meet that full need. Um, now, the, the teacher population in the globe is actually becoming increasingly mobile and it's resulting in actually competition between countries effectively for, for teaching talent. Um, uh, 14,000 teachers left the UK in the past 12 months to go and teach um, overseas. Um, and if you just zoom in on, on one sector, the international school sector, well, the number of international schools has increased by 30%. Um, over the past four or five years since 2013. There's now more than 9,000 of them around the globe and they all want native English speaking teachers with experience of the UK curriculum um, and also the, the, the gold standard QTS qualified teacher um, status um, uh, that uh, UK teachers have to have um, for the classroom. Now, um, it, eventually we're going to run out of road here. We're, we're going to need a, a, a different approach. Um, and uh, TES has been trying to um, explore this territory through what we do with TES Institute, our teacher, uh, teacher training organization. Um, and we've been using a blended learning approach to, to teacher training, um, which is very flexible, um, can be delivered um, in any school. Uh, the academic content is online for self-managed learning. Um, that's complemented by classroom practice. Um, and then the whole process is overseen by a pathway tutor, who's usually an experienced former school leader. Um, and it produces really very good teachers. Now, what we're excited about is that we've been able to take this approach um, and export it into Dubai um, uh, literally within, within the past year um, very successfully and we've taken all this um, content and curriculum material uh, for teacher training um, which has been created um, in line with the, the QTS standard um, and uh, deployed it in another marketplace um, uh, far, thousands of miles away around the world um, and we now have thousands of teachers in Dubai who are benefiting um, from using that material. Now maybe, just maybe, um, that's the first step towards solving some of the bigger problems like you know, how do you just get teachers in developing countries to come up to a, a basic level of expertise such that they can deliver some sort of quality education to the, the millions of children who are growing up in those countries. Yeah, it's just take, uh Robson point, just a, a step further really, I think it's, it's teacher training but it's also going to be about classroom management. We've got a real issue in Great Britain in that there's significant numbers of teachers leaving and there's a scary statistic, so they get to retirement age and they go. Uh, there's a scary statistic as well that something like 25%, might be even more actually, of teachers that are trained leave within the first three years of joining the school. But our population growth is going up. So we've got a young population, uh, we've, got, uh, we've got a population boom. So something's got to give because we've got more young people and we've got fewer professionalised teachers. So just bringing, uh, talking about technology, there's going to be an interesting 
thing happening in the UK over the next few years, which will be about technology being used to manage classrooms. And the role of the teacher will potentially change. Maybe the teacher just looks after a certain number of pupils in the classroom, maybe those with special needs or similar. And actually, it's technology that does the bulk of the teaching. And in terms of China, I mean, I don't know, you guys obviously know tons better than me. I was last here two years ago and went to a number of kindergarten schools, because obviously you guys have got um, more to five-year-olds, um, population increasing. And there's a really interesting message that was coming back from some of the teachers I spoke to, and that is that um, there needs to be more teachers here, particularly for 0 to 5, there needs to be more classroom resources, but there needs to be more professionalised teachers as well. Um, I'm going to more kindergartens tomorrow, so it'll be interesting to see if in the two years that's changed at all. Fantastic. Right, now I did promise to give um, the audience the opportunity to ask any questions. Does anybody have a question? Otherwise, yeah, lovely. Um, do you want to Um, so, a challenge that, that is faced by developers of classroom technologies and content is sort of the, the last mile challenge. How do we get classroom teachers to really not only adopt but truly embrace and integrate whatever content or technology we've developed into their day to day practices? So, that's the question I would posit to the panel, but particularly to Becky and Caroline on how your organizations have accomplished that. I'll go first because I think that Christine's probably got more of the answers to that than me. Um, it certainly is a challenge. Um, and we, we also came across the challenge that we're interested in transformation. We're interested in doing things in the best way possible, which might not be traditional. And it might not be the thing that everybody is used to doing. Um, so therefore, it is about people adopting something new. Um, the way we've gone about that is to find our advocates. I think that that's the really, a really important thing, first and foremost, is find those people who, who share that vision, who understand it, and also have this, this energy, kind of unlike a lot of the teachers who are under pressure and who are, too, who are too tired to pick up something new or do something new. Find the people who actually have that energy, who maybe have even thought of the things that you're doing previously and want to implement them. They've been looking for these tools. Um, and use them as your mouthpiece. Um, use them to help design the way this gets used in the classroom. So obviously, we, we don't, as a company, we're not, we're not in the classroom every day. We're in the classroom as often as we can be. Um, but we're not the teachers delivering this. So for, for me, that's, that's what it's about, is, is get those advocates. Um, and then you go to where Christine is. <laughs> well, just to echo exactly the same message. <laughs> Yeah, find your advocates, work with your advocates. You know, these will be your stakeholders. As you said, you know, you're not there all the time. Um, but it's not just about one, one group. You know, identify a range of stakeholders, whether it's, you, you know, working with your teachers in the classroom, working with the senior leadership teams, working with parents, working with communities. You know, if we could really um, collaborate around this shared goal, what, identify what the goals are. You know, what are the educational goals? What are the, the, you know, the use of technology goals? And if we can collaborate around those goals with a range of stakeholders, you know, we're in it together, uh, and we can really help kind of work towards achieving those goals. Uh, one of the things I think we as Discovery Education learned right from the very early start was, you know, we have to support our educators and be successful in this journey. Identify what those goals are, and, you know, work on it together. Uh, have regular touch points in order to go back and reassess um, and, and pivot if necessary. Um, but my advice is, yeah, get that excitement, get your key stakeholders and, and work on it together. What do you find the best support is? Is that something we're working through a lot? Yeah, absolutely. I think, the, 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 for me, it would be the in-person, right? It's going in, working with the school, um, sitting down, really collaborating around those goals. And it's not just the teacher in the classroom, right? It's, it's great, you know, to get content and, and think about technology in the classroom, but it has to be, you know, classroom up and senior management down you know we have to do this together there has to be an opportunity to um, to think about the use of technology in a strategic way um, so coming back to the point about teachers who are experts and advocates what happens when they leave how have you worked on building capacity and building resilience for when those stakeholders you know leave leave the, leave the classroom or, or leave the school um, so we have to you know really think through and work with a group of folks um, Andrew I'm sure you'll have some thoughts on that what, what, what have you seen in terms of best practice and bringing technology into, into the school? Well, I think, um, I think that the key thing is 
don't get too inflated about it. I mean, you know, don't go for the big gold standard all the time, because you've got to remember as well, and this is just about the UK, um, still teachers are quite technophobic. You know, I mean, we might all be very techie savvy. You might all be techie savvy. I'm not going to speak to myself. And of course, the problem with the UK is the fact that uh, young people, young people have got iPads because their parents have got them and everything else, they start playing with them from the age of about three, four months, six months often, or whatever, because they just follow you know, their parents' actions and things. And there is an issue with UK schools that when young people go into school, they actually find the technology being used is far worse, and far more basic than the stuff they're using at home. So um, I, I think the key thing really is go for the stuff that really works. So in terms of sort of interoperability and so on, go for the stuff that really works, but maybe don't try and set the world alight with something that's all singing or dancing. Work on stuff that is actually deliverable in the classroom and take the teachers with you. Take the teachers with you is a key, a key piece, I think. Well. Um, yeah, I, I think people underestimate the scale of this challenge. I mean, to get technology to work effectively in the classroom, you know, you've got to have the connectivity, um, the devices for every child, the curriculum adapted for it, the assessment adapted for it. Um, but more than anything, the, the teachers need to understand how to bring together the pedagogy and the technology successfully. Um, and often that's simply not in place. And, and the area where we're really short on this is actually in teacher training. In teacher training, does not help teachers uh, to understand at a fundamental level how to bring these two things together. And I think until that changes, um, we won't see um, the consistent adoption that will make a big difference to, to educational standards over time. Um, and certainly that's something that's on our mind with, with TES Institute, but I, I think it's something we have to think about um, across the whole system. So I think what we've heard, uh, we haven't got any um, more time for questions, unfortunately, but I think it's fascinating that since in the early 1980s when I was at school and schools first started to have computers, we had our National Broadcasting Corporation, the BBC, would put computers into our schools. And I remember being led into the classroom where the computer was, and you weren't allowed to touch it, you just looked at it and said, that was the computer in the school. You're like, that's very nice. Now we're getting to the point where... You know, I'd like to say it's after 21 years, but it's a few more years than that. We're actually at the point where it's taken the entire generation to get technology used in half of our lessons. I think from what we've heard, the challenges we're facing, we're going to see a hockey stick. It's not going to be another generation before technology is used in every single lesson. And I think some of the solutions and, and um, companies here and in China solving those problems and working hand in hand with educators is hugely important. Uh, and what I will say, I'm sure, sure colleagues here will be happy to talk to anyone with any questions after the session, but there's also the world's largest teacher event for educational technology, which happens in London every year. It's called BET, and I'm sure all of my colleagues will be at that event. So do reach out through BISA, we're sort of the Trade Association for Education, if you do want to talk to anyone here or any of the other companies, UK companies, and we'd love to have a conversation with you. Thank you very much.